Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see you all, or uh, virtually to see you all, or to connect with you all from all over the world. I am very pleased to have two distinguished guests with us today. And uh, this is uh, a new uh, episode of activities the World Association for Sustainable Development has started recently, which is called Meet the Authors. And uh, today we have two authors, but normally it's me, the author. Each one will have his or her own time to talk about a recent book published, which showed interest to the public domain. So we select these books very carefully because it has to be uh, appealing to a wider audience. And this was introduced uh, virtually last year when we realized the global uh, lockdown has increased and we are still, we never thought we will be more than one year now we're still in the lockdown. But we realized as many people are interested to watch and engage uh, across the world through our uh, webinars. And it has been uh, very successful over the last year. We had many, many webinars and uh, they were very successful. So we thought, okay, fine, let's connect the people or the think tank or those authors with the audience. And this will also give much more better chance for those which are not normally finding it easier to engage or listen or communicate or talk to the authors. Because people like Michael or Joe, academic, senior academic like this, either you meet them face to face, maybe in a conference, because we used to travel face to face, but now we are using this webinar. So we thought it will be very good to give it to a much more wide uh, audience. But most importantly, these webinars have been very successful because the diversity of the audience, they are not normally available in the same room. So I can see now from the people who contacted me, there are people from United Nations Development Program, for example. There are people who are professors at university. There are people who are innovators, SMEs. There are people who I can see here, just top of my head, there is professor of public health. I can see him here. I can see people from, different different backgrounds. So this is maybe also another opportunity to get to listen uh, to distinguished uh, authors uh, about their uh, new books or the books they have published and then engage with them. So the idea of the webinars is to give the author of a particular book 10 to 15 minutes to talk about what is the book is all about. Uh, we try as much as possible to make that as generic as possible so it can be uh, used or, re or received well by the whole audience because we have a wide range of audience. But most importantly, to give you the opportunity to ask the, the author some questions. Uh, I would like to say from here, because we had this last time, some people who are having interesting questions like how I uh, write my book or how I publish my book or how I go. We had many good people in the past. Uh, they volunteered, a couple of professors, I remember. And we will continue to do this. We have done it and we will continue to do it. And uh, I just see now, uh, interestingly, this is Vilma. I know Vilma is from Colombia. So we have our, our global audience is, is spreading really. Now, uh, so try to focus your questions really about the question about the subject itself. And the other thing is we will let you know more about how can you engage more with them in terms of their website, their content and so on. So it's given me really great pleasure to introduce the two, they are distinguished uh, academics, professional, they have the loss of work, but uh, the topic itself is very interesting and very exciting. And that's why you can see the diversity of people interested to listen to it. We heard about it for the last, I don't know, five to 10 years, maybe more than that. But in the last five years, this has become, if we exclude these two years of the COVID, games and gamifications, uh, what is games, how we use games, even I remember at the University of Sussex in 2018, I think, we had someone like uh, those two distinguished guests came to us. I remember I went to the staff uh, one day workshop. Even people, they were exploring how to use games in teaching at the university. So many people have talked about using games in leadership, improving the style of leadership. How do we manage better? What is, uh, so understanding of the games and gamification in business or in training or in teaching has increasingly become an important subject. But at the same time, it has become an important, increasingly important, and there's a demand for people to learn about it. There have been also uh, something which is not odd to that, but there's not many people actually uh, have written in this subject. There's not many people actually 
they know this subject exactly what is it. So to have to distinguish the speaker today, I think is a great uh, honor for us. So let me start. Uh, who is want to go first so I can introduce him? Michael or Joe? So let's go with Dr. Okay. So my first guest, uh, which I'm pleased to introduce him, uh, he's someone is well known, I'm sure, for all those people who are involved in the game and gamification or in this kind of subject for a long time. He's very well known. You can Google him. He has been uh, has written lots of articles, uh, books, uh, special issue. I remember we had the honor to write together a joint special issue on gamification. So he's going. Uh, his name is Michael Soto. Michael is an academic. I will let him to introduce himself even better. But he is currently the chief game uh, based learning uh, or the CEO of uh, the uh, game based learning consultancy. I can tell you the name of it now, which is a firm, which he will tell us better. But he is based in the US, but he traveled a lot. Even I think he was on a webinar uh, last week with many conferences during the last period. So we will listen to him. His recent book, which he is going to talk to us about it. Uh, I think the book is less, uh, is not, uh, is, is recently been published. He's been used for the last period. The book is called Emotify, the power of the human element in game-based learning, serious games and experiential education. Uh, Michael already spoken in several conferences we have. He got a video also, I will share it with you after we finish, uh, when he talked about using games in teaching and learning in our recent conference about the Middle East, the future of higher education in the Middle East. So Michael, with, without further ado, but also please uh, add to my introduction about yourself, where you came to become an expert in this field. Uh, and the floor is yours. Michael has a presentation, will give, will present it to us about his book. And then we open up for a small discussion. We bring Joe in and then we have a group discussion. We will hopefully answer as many questions as we could. So the floor is yours, Michael. Thank you very much, Alam. I really appreciate the privilege and opportunity to be here today with uh, the uh, potential challenge of acquainting quite a large group and a very broad range of folk about this whole area of game-based learning. Uh, Joe and I have been working together for a period of time, and both Joe and I have recently decided that uh, it's great to let the world know a little bit more about our books. Hold on. Now, the first thing I just wanna expose everyone to is text instead of a graphic. I mean, one of the interesting uh, challenges uh, I, I and my co-author had is, how do we get people to learn about gamification and game-based learning? while at the same time making sure that we provide them an actual experience. So our book is about games, simulations, serious games, immersive learning environments. And we've tried to cover a very broad range of uh, cases where games have been either used in the classroom or in training in corporate environments or as part of the onboarding experience within corporate environments. And when Alam says, please, Michael, introduce yourself, I'm the fellow on the left-hand side. When I grew up, my whole life was one in which I spent a lot of time in the public library. And my co-author, who's on the right, uh, was a very, very uh, superbly known uh, Madison Avenue salesperson. Now, <clears throat> I was the type of person people called a nerd, simply because I would spend hours in the library and I would learn all about a number of games like Stratego, Diplomacy, uh, a, a wide range of games, chess, Go, in which I spent my life immersed in that type of mental environment. And then one of the, the uh, critical success factors Kevin Allen and I identified was this whole area of emotional intelligence. I mean, one, one element in emotional intelligence is the, the capability 
to make sure the emotions can make your thoughts more intelligent. I mean, it is called emotional intelligence and that a person can think intelligently about emotions. This has always been a challenge for folks is that when we are dealing with leadership, teamship, community ship, communications, is the most intelligent person in the room the best person to lead? Often that is not the case because they do not have the skill set to perceive, express, or regulate their emotions. There are a number of theories behind emotional intelligence, and I really want to emphasize that I'm actually a scholarly practitioner, uh, not a pure academic. I spent the, the first 30 years of my life as an entrepreneur and a business person setting up corporations and knowledge centers across the world. Cole, Goldman has an, a particular theory that suggests that almost 90% of the skills needed for success are emotional and social. So it's really about people and relationships. Meyer Salavi also has a particular theory and model about perceiving, understanding, managing emotions to facilitate thinking. One of my favorites is Baron's work. We used Baron in many of my MBA classes to provide the capability for learners to uh, take a uh, emotional quotient inventory assessment and then be provided with an outline of the particular social skills, non-cognitive skills, or competencies that are really important for them to develop. So the book was built on a framework of quests. We created quests with, within the book so that people would have a way to navigate through the book that really follows what normally takes place in gamification. Uh, this is, was a unique approach. So we have a number of challenges, particular missions for them to, to achieve in order to navigate through the book itself. But one of the underlying conceptual frameworks for game-based learning is what's called the flow concept. And this is where you balance boredom and anxiety in order to push individuals who are involved in a simulation or a serious game to achieve flow. Uh, flow is a well-known psychological concept. And I've been involved in delivering many games, entrepreneurship games, leadership games, teamship games, in which we attempt to achieve flow with the participants so they lose track of time and they are in what's called the zone. Many of you have probably experienced the zone when you were involved in particular activities. That's where you are just so immersed in it that everything around you disappears. So we try to balance skills that individual need to exhibit with the challenges for them to exhibit those skills. From a business value prop proposition, I'm not trying to sell my book, but I really want to emphasize that two of the uh, critical success factors we uh, had in mind when we published was to make sure people had reliable assessment tools that they could use either in training or in the classroom, to be able to assess that learning takes place with serious games, role-playing games, simulations, or immersive learning environments uh, such as Second Life. In addition to that, we created and documented a number of case studies that demonstrate best practices as well as worst practices for using gamification. For example, one of the uh, challenges we run into in many corporations is that they say, oh, we're, we're going to gamify an environment. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, who exactly are you going to assign to do this? Oh, well, Joe isn't doing anything right now. Uh, does Joe have a sense of humor? I don't mean Joe, my, my co-presenter uh, today, but just the general Joe. And often I hear, well, he, he's not exactly the funniest guy, or he really doesn't know what fun and play is about, but he's the only resource we have to gamify the environment. 
Well, that's your worst case scenario. It will fail miserably. Our goal was to expose instructors and trainers to this whole area of experientially based simulations and serious games. And to be able to evaluate, develop customized coaching plans for each learner who participates in games. For example, Fligby, which is a game actually developed by uh, Chitsen Mihaly, the author of Flow, in which leaders are continually challenged with about 200 uh, decision points in a simulation that takes between seven and nine hours to complete. That's correct. You heard that. Seven to nine hours. Now, let me just bring up for a second uh, the assessment model that the, the authors of that game have had. And you'll get a feel for exactly what I'm speaking of. This is the cells that are assessed during this big range of uh, decision-making that takes place. And during that, the individuals have to work with other team members and demonstrate leadership capabilities to be able to uh, win at the game. Uh, the game is really how to manage a company in very turbulent times. And the individuals are continually provided feedback from an avatar called Mr. Fligby, who challenges them to make sure that the organization continues to exhibit flow. So let me go back to my original slides for a second. So really to wrap up a bit, there's a major quest, the book outlines, major set of quests, missions, goals, and an individual who gets through the book will have an excellent idea of either how to build or buy a particular serious game or simulation, how to deliver it, how to get buy-in from your sponsors. We've run across this a number of times in universities where a dean will say, well, the students, the learners are having too much fun. How is it they can learn when they're having fun or playing? And we use assessment tools that demonstrate specifically that the individuals have acquired new knowledge and can definitely uh, uh, share that knowledge with others in the group. So I'm going to wrap up and turn this over now to my colleague, Joe Biz, on his book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That was very useful. Thank you very, very much. Now, uh, before we go to Joe, uh, as, as I said, at the end, we will open for questions. But if there is any burning question, which cannot wait until we get Joe to present his book, uh, because I, I don't want to, but you can actually either send it in the chat or keep it until we finish. Uh, the, just to remind those who they are following us now or joining us now, uh, this is a Meet the Author uh, session where we give uh, people from across the world to have the opportunity to engage or listen to a short summary about a recent book or from the author themselves where they can engage with them and they maybe ask them questions and maybe they can follow up with them later. So uh, let me move now to the second book author, which we are very delighted to have with us is Professor Joe Biz, which is a, who is a professor of English at uh, the City University of New York in the US. His forthcoming book is called The Allure of Play, The Educator's Design Guide to active learning exercise and games. And again, Joe has been uh, actively involved in games uh, and he has done lots of workshop trainings. He's a very experienced, again, he got his own block. Uh, are you, uh, 
it's, it's not a, a question now we can answer. Now, uh, Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Again, Joe, he got a short presentation about his forthcoming book, and then we will open it for discussion. Uh, those from outside the Zoom, could you please either just continue send your questions through the Facebook, we will take them, or uh, those in the, in the Zoom, either use the chat or use the hand sign when we finish. So Joe, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here today. Um, and I am video chatting with all of you from Brooklyn, New York City. So hello. Michael, thanks for sharing with us. I definitely got some questions for you at the end. So my book is called The Allure of Play, Educator's Design Guide to Active Learning Exercises in Games. It's written with my co-author, uh, Victoria Mandeli, who's not here today. Um, so the problem we were facing, as you can probably guess. Joe, if sorry to interrupt you, can you yeah. use the big uh, display one? Uh, sorry. Sure, no problem. So it will be, yeah. There Thank we go. You. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the problem we were facing is how do we make our instruction more engaging, uh, whether that's for in-person or online? Uh, so we came up with the design method uh, so that people could build their own, what we call activity games, somewhere between activities and games, a little bit of both mixed together, very low tech, no fancy video games. Uh, what you might be able to do with pen and paper uh, when you're in the office, when you're in the classroom, maybe some discussion boards if you're teaching online or even just PowerPoint. So think low tech. Uh, my research is in game-based learning. I've been doing this for maybe a decade now if you didn't already know, this is related to other theories such as experiential learning theory. And I've had a lot of success with this. People are very interested, especially now in learning how to make their exercises more engaging. I present uh, nationally, internationally on this topic maybe a dozen times per year. So the link, even if we've never used game bef games before, the link I want us to think about is active learning. If you've ever tried to add a little bit of interaction to your training exercise, your presentation, your lesson plan, in order to make it more fun or just more social, what you came up with was probably already close to a learning game. So I'd like us to take about 20 seconds uh, to think about one exercise you've taught before in the workplace, in the classroom, where your learners were actively involved. It should be mostly non-digital. And if you've never been in any kind of instruction, remember some kind of exercise that you've participated in or perhaps an exercise that you've heard of. Uh, so again, here's our prompt. And I'd like us to just think about it for maybe 20 seconds and try to hold it in your head. I think we need a fun little timer. So here's a nice website for timers. And let's start that up. Let's think about this. OK, great. And we'll come back to what you did in just a moment. Now, many gamification authors talk about how the learning principles contained in good games are also useful for instruction, uh, which is true. But few authors discuss the practical side. How do we actually take the exercises we already have and make them more playful? So maybe we're not interested in bringing in a, a large budget video game into our classroom in the workspace, but we just wanna make our own instruction just a little bit more playful. What are some small steps we can take? That's what my book talks about. So here's the first part of my method. I believe that there are five mechanics that can make your instruction more playful. Essentially, the pace of your exercise should be rapid, or random. 
the goal of your exercise should have a reward, a rival, or a role. Now, I don't mean you should add these to your whole exercise, just parts of it. Let's call them the playful parts. I named these the five simple mechanics. Let's look at each one in detail. So our first one is called random. I'm using the word students here on these images, uh, but please substitute this with employees or learners. Um, so an exercise with a random pace could allow your students, your learners, your employees to recreate the meaning themselves. There's some implements that are often used to achieve a random pace. There could be some kind of dice, you could use some kind of cards, you could have them solving the content through a puzzle. Uh, what are some examples? Well, uh, maybe you have a textbook, a training manual, workbook, you have a chapter, and you can break this into sets of six questions. Uh, for every set of question, your learners are only reviewing the question that corresponds to the number that they roll on a die. So they're rolling some kind of dice and only answering some of those questions. And I'll talk more about that exercise in a moment. Another example, uh, perhaps you have to give some kind of a lecture. Carve up your lecture onto a series of flashcards. Shuffle it, give it to your learners. Now your learners have to figure out the conceptual relationships between these chunks of information. Huh. So talking a little bit more about uh, the first example of a workbook, I used to think that when you're teaching uh, games or play and trying to use play in a classroom, it has to be some kind of a big change that you're making, uh, but it doesn't. So uh, in my beginning writing classroom, uh, that I teach, since I'm an English professor. Uh, I like to prepare little fun exercises for my students. Um, usually I work on these for a while, but we're all busy. One day I'm riding the subway. I didn't have time to think out how to make the day more engaging. So I just brought a bunch of dice with me and I said, I'll, I'll figure it out when I get there. Okay, when I'm walking down the hall. Okay, when I get into class. Nope, too late. Okay, what are we doing? Um, students, they're all happy and waiting for me. Um, take out your workbooks and uh, for every six questions, let's break them into sets. Uh, here's a six sided dice. Uh, if you could roll it, you only have to answer the question for each section that corresponds to the number you roll on the die. So I'm saying this to them and I, I think this sounds really lame. It's not really, it's not a game. It's, it's barely anything, but they're good students, they following what I'm saying, they're rolling the dice, they're falling off the table, not the students, the dice. Uh, they're answering, they're answering. This goes on for an hour, lots of workbook exercises, it's pretty necessary to do a lot of drilling. At the end of my class, one of my more advanced learners is waiting to talk to me. So I'm feeling a little bit embarrassed. Everyone leaves, a student comes up to me, I start apologizing. Saying, look, I know I usually try to be very engaging. I, I create these games and, and things. I just didn't have a lot of time today. So I just, this is what I came up with. Professor, I kind of like that activity. Uh, how could you like that activity? It was barely a game. It was barely anything. Are you just being nice to me? No, Professor, I, I, I found it pretty interesting. But it was barely a game. I could see that, Professor. I understand what you're saying. but even though we were just rolling dice, it was still random. And for some reason, I don't know why, my brain really, really likes random. So that blew my mind and just got me re-experiencing the fact that how adding just a little bit of element can still be heavily engaging uh, to learners. So let's look at another example. Second simple mechanic that I came up with is rapid. Uh, adding a little bit of a rapid pace to your exercise can simplify the details for your learners. Now, I'm not saying these are appropriate uh, necessarily for every lesson or part of a lesson that you're teaching, but it could work 
uh, for many different examples. So we have a few instances for how rapid could be achieved. Uh, a few more complicated ways, perhaps you have a presentation that you can actually rush through. This should be a short presentation. So rush through it the first time, then redo it more slowly, amplifying the parts that are confusing. So you basically just force yourself to do an overview. And the second presentation will now have more direction and context for your learners. Another example. A lot of teachers like to show movies. And in the business world, I know that a PowerPoint reigns supreme. Um, but these are still passive learning techniques. So for example, perhaps I'm showing a film about ancient Rome or giving some kind of PowerPoint discussing ancient Rome or whatever my topic is. Pause that video, ask, can anyone identify the structures from our textbook that are being shown right now in this video? Let's just take one minute to write them down as the movie's playing. Then we'll see who got the most correct. Go, set that timer, go back to your PowerPoint or video. Suddenly you've given people an activity, a quest to use a term that Michael introduced to us during what could otherwise be a passive presentation. So here's another example of using rapid. Ah, so I'd like us to think about now that active learning exercise from the beginning uh, that I asked you to think about, one that you've done in the classroom. Um, and my task for you now is a little harder. Explain to yourself, so you're just reflecting on this, how either random or rapid was in that active learning exercise that you did, just a little bit. And if it wasn't in it, think about how you might add it to your exercise. So we gotta feel loose and playful right now. We're not necessarily thinking about, is that even appropriate? Would it work? We're just thinking of a possibility, therefore adapting a playful design mindset. So think about how one of these simple mechanics was present and that active learning exercise that you thought about a few moments ago, or how you might add it. And uh, it's time to use a little bit of rapid. Uh, Joe. Yep. Uh, or let, let me, okay, let, let you do it to finish it, no problem. <laughs> And a perfect time for a question. Okay, I, I, I will let you finish. But just a question: When people read the book, uh, uh, how engaging? Because now the way you present it, um, I'm, I'm, we'll go back to Michael his uh, self. Uh, is it is, 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 is because when see it's, is it a normal book, and when you read it, the same like you're reading most of a textbook or a book or a professional text or is it engaging in a way I will feel engaged or strike? Because I think the difficulty with uh, with the COVID, with some kind of knowledge of area, it is slightly challenging to try to get it. So how do you get the book? I mean, do you, the feel of the book, is it going to be engaging in the way you're presenting it now? Or how does it look like? Thank you for your question, which is also a nice little compliment uh, <laughs> in the middle <laughs> of my presentation. Um, so, I'm an academic, perhaps some of you listening are also academics. Um, and as you know, we have colleagues perhaps that are not necessarily that engaging, especially when they're writing the written word. Uh, my co-author and I were, let's just put it this way, critically concerned about how to make a book that could be as engaging as possible. Um, and so we arrived at that for a few methods. Uh, one is our tone. Uh, one is making sure that we're always coming back to the practical. So though we also present theory, it's also within the context of how do we apply it? How do we apply it? How do we apply it? I've been researching now, again, for many years. Uh, in the beginning, I don't mind saying this, we all learn, right? I focused a little bit too much on the research and the theory 
but it's not always clear on how to apply research and theory, even though those things are, imper are important. So through tone, uh, through being practical, and through using images and charts and a sort of uh, design uh, check-in method, this is how we're seeking to make our book uh, as practical as possible. Uh, and just a brief aside, um, before I had the book, the only way I taught my theories uh, was through workshops and these cards. So these images you see are actually a card game that I designed uh, to teach people how to make their instructions more engaging. Now, who does that, right? So I'm definitely concerned uh, with trying to make these uh, ideas as practical and interesting as possible. Okay, I can see. Maybe we'll start with Vilma. She got. She said the following question. I'm, 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 I will give her the opportunity, Ferris. But uh, if I ask you that uh, standard question at university, who is it for? Undergraduate, postgraduate, general public, uh, a manager. Uh, who is it for? Yep. Thank you for your question. Um, so our book, our book is published uh, with the prime audience of being for people in higher education. So. This is the main audience. This would be faculty, staff, instructional designers, people in administration who are interested in making their instruction more playful or engaging, whether that's online or in person. Um, however, my colleague and I, my writing partner and I discovered um, that this is not our only, audi only audience. Uh, we have a lot of business people that attend our workshops. I've given workshops specifically uh, for the business world, also people in K through 12. Um, so a secondary audience of our book are these groups as well, especially uh, training managers who need to create exercises for their employees and they're interested in making them a little bit more playful. Um, but the examples in our book are usually examples from higher ed. So they'll use words like students, et cetera. The method, the method, works for any level of instruction or academic or for business. Okay, and Michael, uh, again, the same question for you. How your book is, is, uh, is, is, is written in a way, is it the same engaging or the same? I mean, how is it engaging with that? Is, how different is it from the normal uh, books we use in uh, public or in our universities or uh, how different is it, it is. And the second question is, who is it for? Again, the same question, is it for under, both graduates? Before I can open. Well, <clears throat> to answer the first question, looks like we have a number of people crashing in via Facebook. There we go. Uh, the answer to the first question, uh, I had outlined this idea that uh, our book creates quests and missions to be achieved by the reader. Okay. So it forces the individual reading the book to go off on a number of missions and do things and to come back. So it's not just a, a passive book about reading about experiential education or games and simulations. The reader actually has to achieve a number of uh, 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 to complete a number of activities. And so our goal was to identify an audience that could start to learn by reading the book about what this field was about. We actually had a very broad audience, everyone from chief learning officers to training instructors and corporations, professors, instructional designers. So our goal was to give a number of these individuals an opportunity to see what game-based learning was about by doing activities that are part of the book. Okay. Uh, let's just quick, quickly, uh, maybe a quick answer to some of the question. Top five, what is your real, sorry, what is your, which are your top five uh, real-time strategic games for both of you? Maybe Joe? Top five uh, real thank time. You, thank you for this question. Um, so I'm going to take the next hour uh, to review my top five <laughs> strategy games. Ah, uh, this is what the talk's really about. Um, I would say the number one game uh, 
both for its strategy, but because of how much everyone in this call could just learn from it and modify it, perhaps teach any instructional goal that we have, is a game called Pandemic. Now, this is just a coincidence that the game that I'm picking has a title um, that is reflecting a lot of what we're going through you know, right now in the real world. Uh, but there is a board game uh, called Pandemic. It's very famous, very well done, cooperative and not competitive, uh, where you play the role of a researcher, and so does somebody else, uh, another player. So you're all on the same team. And you'd be given the task of defeating uh, these diseases that are threatening the world. A lot of attention on the cooperation, also attention on, on the strategy and a simplistic but useful simulation of exponential growth of disease. So that would be my number one. Okay, Mike, you? Uh, my first one is Fresh Biz Game, which is an entrepreneurship game that <clears throat> has a very interesting hidden agenda. The agenda is to try to acquaint the participants with what entrepreneurship is at its core. And so it's actually played twice. The first time I have the participants play it, it's a board game. Uh, I provide a number of rules and I launch them to play. And they have 20 minutes to play the game and try to achieve uh, the goal, the goal being to win the game. Well, they approach it very much like Monopoly. So the whole idea is to crush the competition. So at the end, a number of tables will say, I won, I won, I, I got to the winner's circle first. And then after all the tables have completed, I say, wow, I think I forgot to tell you what the go real goal here was. It's not to crush the competition. If you're an entrepreneur, your goal is to collaborate and to bring all of the participants to the winner's circle with you, not behind you, but with you. So now I want you to play it a second time. And this time, I want you to work with your collaborators and your build strategic alliances. Well, the second game is totally different because they approach the first game as competition, but the second game as collaboration. Okay, uh, we will follow film a question quickly and then I will ask you that question. Which game could say is essential to apply in the organizational field? Again, to both of you. I'll take it briefly and then uh, Michael, you might, I'm sure have some rich ideas on this. Um, so I mentioned the game Pandemic. And again, this would also specifically uh, fill this area uh, because like a lot of games, but especially for this game, uh, the board game is essentially a classification system uh, for how diseases migrate across the world. So when I've used this in my workshops, um, the audience uh, makes the connection. I help them make the connection uh, that you can use this kind of a board game structure to essentially map out or classify the problem or concept that you're trying to explore uh, with your learners. So you're basically trying to simulate it. How does it work? People can look at how it works, play with how it works, and therefore better understand the problem space. Uh, Michael? Thanks, Joe. Uh, there are actually two um, almost equal games that uh, have a significant impact in organizational training. The first is called Jungle Escape. The second is called Silent Towers. In Jungle Escape, the teams, normally teams of five, must build a helicopter physically out of parts uh, because they're stuck in the jungle and they have to escape before the monsoon comes. And of course, I run around the room with a sprayer, spraying them with water all the time, telling them the monsoon is coming, the monsoon is coming. And their whole goal is to find a way to communicate with each other about what the parts are they need and how they've got to assemble them. And it builds significant teamship. Equal to that is another one called Silent Tower, 
which is about communication. So they have to build using Lego blocks, a particular configuration of a tower, each individual having a separate specification they cannot share with another individual. And they have to do it by not talking. So they have to develop uh, other forms of communication to be able to put that tower together and match it against the actual overall spec that the instructor has. So the, both of them, from a communication perspective and a teamship perspective, build a new sense of community among the participants. Okay, do you know of a university using games or tried using games in, the, in its teaching? And do you expect this to become common in the next, uh, maybe, I don't know, he is saying here in the next period, I'm not sure what the period mean, but maybe let's talk about three, four, five years. But are you aware of any universities which is, uh, because you are exposed in this area, using in uh, their teaching uh, at universities? Go so, ahead, Joe. Sure. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and start with my university. Um, okay. Then I'll mention uh, another university. Uh, so I've had the good fortune some years ago of starting a professional development network uh, for my college. So I teach at the City University of New York. That's a conglomeration of over a dozen different colleges throughout New York City. I've started a network, a hub of different educators who are basically uh, leaders in using games and play. Um, and we've been presenting too much uh, over the past decade to all the other colleges, uh, to their centers for teaching and learning, to smaller events. Um, and there's been a lot of interest uh, from people, librarians, faculty, instructional designers, for how to use games, or even just playful activities, which is sometimes what I'm focusing on uh, in the classroom. So it's starting to become a much bigger deal at CUNY and there's people other than me who are looking at escape rooms and are looking at different facets uh, of this issue. Um, going outside of CUNY, Columbia College, also New York City, Columbia University uh, has a college called uh, Barnard. And perhaps uh, some of you are aware uh, that years ago, I think it was about a decade ago, uh, they came out with something called reacting to the past, um, which, I'm gonna say this, it's gonna sound unbelievable, but it's, it's totally true. Uh, they came out with all of these simulation books about how to teach history as a simulation game, as a role-playing game. And they got so big that they started asking faculty to write them. So they start writing these books that are role-playing games. And now it's gone beyond history. It's in the social sciences. The past few years, it's even, um, they got a, I think it was an NSF grant. It's moved into the sciences. It's moved into, into math. So faculty get together at these conferences. Sometimes they put on little outfits and they just role play with each other. One of these scenarios in order to get training for using it in their classroom uh, with their students. And the energy and the play, if you watch these videos, you can probably see them on YouTube is, is astounding. Okay, Michael, do you have any example? Well, I think this is quite uh, a good example, uh, Joe gave, yeah? The, the question is, uh, which universities are using, using this? I would have to respond a little bit more generally uh, and basically say thousands. The reality is that many universities are experimenting with and attempting to implement uh, game-based learning. Many of the instructors, many of the faculty are discovering that this re-engages and motivates their learners in a way that, as Joe described it, passive learning just does not. Most of us in our traditional upbringing have gone to absolutely boring lectures, and we know that is not the way to educate people. In fact, uh, my book outlines uh, uh, at least 20 case studies of university application of game-based learning. Here in Phoenix, the University of Arizona uses it in all of their leadership courses. Uh, they use Fligby, the, the particular simulation I was talking about. I mean, think of it. That university has committed to 
have their learners online for up to nine hours to play an online simulation and then to receive a report that outlines particular competencies that need to develop, be developed by these participants to become better in the workplace. So there are thousands of them out there. This is not isolated uh, activities at all. The challenge is at a university, and I had it at mine, uh, I had a very hard time convincing my colleagues that people could play, have fun, and learn at the same time. So we developed an approach in the book on how to justify implementing game-based learning in the classroom, whether it was corporate classrooms or university classrooms. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, before I take another question from the Facebook, anyone from the Zoom, uh, either you send it on the chat or you use that facility of the hand. Any question from the people with us in the Zoom? Before I go to another question from the Facebook. Uh, I cannot see a question here. Okay, now the... Uh, Sorry, I don't want to be saying Now the question is, another question, how long it takes me to learn it? I mean, uh, maybe if I can add to this question, I mean, for people to learn how to use it, would they just, if, if they, they buy your book and read it, would that they be able to, I mean, if it's something you read, you can use it, or if it's something you need to practice it. So how long, I think the question here, if I can ex expand more on this uh, question is, how long really you need to, how long it will take you in order to be able to use it, whether in, in a training or in a classroom or in leadership, whatever the applications, how long do you think, or what, do, how, what is the learning process? Do you have to go to college or you just read books like yours, listen to workshop or what is it? Joe, why don't you begin? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I gotta recover my... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just extending the question. <laughs> um, this is a great question and very important because we're always getting books and software trying to train us on something, right? Um, so with my book and my method, we're very aware of this because we've been teaching it in workshops now for over a decade. Um, so we decided specifically to teach this topic as a spectrum. And that spectrum is from just using a little bit of playful elements, which you could learn within 10 minutes, uh, as I was showing you during this PowerPoint. Hopefully some of you just had ideas started popping in your head and you're probably wondering, am, am I right? Am I right? That's the beginning. That's you doing this. And perhaps you've even done it before, but now I'm trying to give you some of the language and the terms to go a little bit further. Um, that being said, my book goes into a very lengthy method and keeps adding to it. So when you're ready for a little bit more, it gives you a little bit more, then it gives you a little bit more. And then it has a small, even advanced chapter that some readers might not ever use, talks about badges and other things, but other readers might be fascinated by, and they'll take just the part that works for them. Um, to wrap this up, there are two things that can quickly make you a lot better at using games. Number one, as you can probably guess how, what I'm gonna say, is just attending a community or more workshops on the subject, uh, like the one that Michael and I will be uh, holding and we'll talk about at the end of this presentation. Number two has nothing to do with Michael or I, has to do with you and your colleagues. And that's brainstorming with somebody else who's clever, who's creative, and just working with that person. That will get you so far in using playful design thinking, just working with at least one other person and bouncing your ideas off of them. I'll, I'll, add, okay, Mike, bit, yeah. I'll add a bit to that, Joe. And <clears throat> I, I get presented with this question quite often at conferences or even in my own universities where I teach. And that is, um, could I teach game-based learning? And my first response is, when was the last time you played a game? Oh, I haven't played a game in years. Well, it's not gonna work. 
you definitely have to have a gameful mindset. If you don't have a gameful mindset, you're going to bore people with what you think is game-based learning, and then they're going to be turned off of, of uh, accepting any activity that might be gamified. So you have to practice. Uh, I often recommend people, there, there are groups around a city, uh, this was pre-COVID, but it, you can do it online now, where you can work with folks who every week get together and play games. Well, that's a great way to begin to practice because then you start to learn about the mechanics, rules, aesthetics, all the different elements that go into building games. And if you're not the kind of person that feels that you can have fun, your students, your learners, your employees are not going to have fun either. So you have to take on a new mindset. And part of my book talks about building that mindset to be able to engage people in activities that they're going to develop extrinsic and intrinsic uh, value from. If it's strictly entertainment as a game, it's not game-based learning. But if it's about learning outcomes that are supposed to be achieved by the participants, then that is about game-based learning. But remember, these are all experientially based activities. That means they can't be passive. Uh, I, let, let me just uh, share a, a screenshot for you for a moment. Uh, which one? Here. I ended up having all of the learners in one of my classes go out into the hallway and do a game. They engaged in a game. It was a tactile experience. There was shouting, there was screaming, there was laughing. And I even had faculty come out of their classrooms going, you guys gotta quiet this down. I said, these people are learning. It's not a quiet experience to learn. And that's really what I'm trying to emphasize to instructors who wanna do this. This is not about you being in control of a classroom or an activity or a training experience, you have to give up some of that control. You have to be able to respond to the fact that things are gonna go 20 different ways that you're not expecting. You have to feel comfortable with that. If you don't, if you want them to have their, their quizzes and essays and, and you wanna lecture at them, this is not for you. So find something else. But if you want to change and transform the educational experience for your learners, this is a tool to do that. Excellent. So we can we can explore shortly, but before that, any question uh, from uh, any question before I ask uh, both Joe and Michael kindly, they're going to just take us maybe quickly. They, they, they do organize lots of their trainings. They, they, they can coach you into, if you want to advance into this, uh, uh, if you like uh, becoming a good, uh, using these techniques and approaches. And uh, we don't know when, but it's likely to be mid-May. Oh, we, we, we will advertise it. But if there's any question before I ask, uh, maybe Michael, if you don't mind, uh, do you know is, is StarCraft? Uh, v uh, Vilma, uh, what, what uh, sorry, I maybe I didn't get that question. Do you know StarCraft? What do you think about that? StarCraft? Just asking a clarification. StarCraft, oh, sorry, board game, sorry. Uh, okay. What do, you, what do you think about that? I'm not sure what, what is the question. Well, but well, there are over 10,000 maybe 25,000 board games. Regretfully, I don't know them all. Okay. So I wouldn't be able to respond to that. Okay, real-time strategy game. So I haven't um, actually played this game, but I've heard people, yeah, who have played this game, uh, both online and the board game implementation of it. And they're heavy fans and they believe that it, it's a really masterfully done decision-making uh, strategy game. Um, also appealing to people who like the sci-fi uh, mythology that is StarCraft. So it's got that going on for it as well. 
Okay. Well, well done, Joe. I, I, <laughs> I must say, you must play hundreds and thousands of games. <laughs> Martin, uh, as I said, uh, we're going to organize one of this workshop, uh, possibly mid-May. Uh, we will do, we will agree with the time, of course, and it's going to be online. Uh, and we have done this lots of time online, but uh, you don't need lots of technical re re readiness or requirement apart from just having good access to the Zoom and good internet from countries where there's a problem with the internet. So Michael, if you don't mind, uh, can you just take us through what will be in these three hours we are hoping to do in May? And uh, uh, likely if someone wants to start embark on to learning process with you, uh, I can see. Does anyone have a question before he? I I hear someone. Uh... But Mark, yes, go ahead. Uh, take us through. Uh, what? Wh how can you coach people for how long? And just give us an idea. Well, coaching and mentoring is a long-term process, but I, I wanted to bring up on my screen. Uh, an outline of our first workshop, which uh, provides a sense of how we approach this. We're going to be beginning with a scavenger hunt, a Zoom scavenger hunt, to talk about how you formulate quests. And then we're going to develop a dialogue with the participants on developing this gameful mindset. How do you approach play and fun? How can you approach it? We then embark upon a quick game called the Value Card Sword Game. And then after a break, uh, Joe launches into what's your game plan with the type of cards and activities we've been talking about so far. And then later in the session, it'll be a half a day session, uh, I'll be exposing the participants to what's called a self-reflection model. This model is, has been used extensively in my courses. I've published on this quite a bit. And it's really how to get your, your participants to think deeply about the experience, the experiential experience they just went through, through their cognitive, how they think about thinking, through their emotional uh, uh, experience, and through their behavioral changes. And then we look at uh, a number of possibilities about how you you really build for fun in your future courses or activities within the courses. Okay, and, and, and that will give people just more of understanding of what is gamification and as a, as a setup, and that people they have to build up on. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, the half a day session is really to create a foundation for people to feel comfortable in having fun and building play into their learning activities. Okay. And then there'll be a second workshop, which will take place over a couple of days, where we go more into the coaching and mentoring experience, looking at the architecture behind games and helping individuals to structure how they will approach uh, building gamified experiences in their learning engineering situations. Okay, and is there any specific uh, bro profile of the of the of the at, at, uh, participants? For example, when I was at Sussex, we had a workshop, I think that was quite a long one from nine to five. Uh, there is no any prerequisite. So the selective staff, we came and we got the training uh, or the introduction to game based learning and so on. So is there anything people they need to think of if it's good for me or not? And uh, whom do you think it can be? This is for everyone, right? Joe, why don't you approach yeah. that? Oh, um, there's absolutely no prerequisites, uh, as Michael is, is, is trying to outline. Uh, this is meant for people of all levels who are interested in getting a foundation and thinking about gameful design, thinking about play. Um, that being said, even if you're a veteran and you've done this before, you're still gonna find it useful because it's only gonna go deeper for you because you'll get to apply what it is that you've already thought about. Um, our second workshop though, which will be more advanced, we'll have this first workshop as a prerequisite, so. 
Okay, uh, I think we're only nine minutes above our time, but it's, it's great. Thank you. It was very, it's a pleasure listening to you. Any question? Uh, any question before we wrap up this? And I think, uh, and the, the one thing, uh, any question? Either chat or either raise your hand. Uh, uh, both of them, they have their own website, they have their contact details, they are available in both. Uh, we will share them maybe at the end of, uh, yeah, excellent. <laughs> That's it. And I'm sure we can add them to the video. Uh, Mervin will add them to the video at the end. So you can approach them, uh, not only with what we have just done here, they just gave us a very short introduction, but they have looked to the most uh, very rich uh, platform. I have looked at them, I read them, they're extremely useful. And uh, definitely we will announce any time uh, sooner uh, when we are going to have them both formally delivering that three hours uh, talk. Uh, if there's no any question, I can't see any question or any hand raised. Thank you very much uh, to both of you really. Uh, I'm sorry to drag you that early. I know in the US it's quite early morning. This is a problem we face all over the last lockdown year. It's very difficult to get people because it's too extreme. The US, particularly the US and Asia, they're far away. And those are sleeping, those are waking up. So thank you very much for waking up earlier, both of you, Michael and Joe. And thank you very much for talking to us about your books. Uh, we will get this uh, video definitely uploaded. It will be available on our YouTube as usual. And it's already in the Facebook, so for now. And uh, hopefully we will see you our next book, I think we're going to talk about leadership with two authors from, co-authors from Australia. Australia and New Zealand. It's quite a good book about leadership in I Connected World. So we will come back to you that one, but thank you very much for all those who uh, have joined us. I appreciate it, it was a short note. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.